The Theory of Knowledge and Islamic Perspective by Ayatollah Murtada Mutahari. Chapter 10 Objections to the Logic of Action. Our discussion was about the criterion for knowledge, and we studied and reviewed the theory which holds that the only criterion for knowledge is action. On the contrary, classical theory maintains that knowledge is the criterion for knowledge and classifies knowledge into knowledge which is criterion itself and knowledge which is not criterion itself. I shall explain the first remaining small part of the last session's discussion and then I will embark on the present subject. Summary of the Objections to the Logic of Action The gist of the theory which states that action cannot be the criterion for knowledge is as follows. First, granted that we accept this theory, we still cannot totally accept it because we have types of knowledge, facts, and information which, although their certainty is definite for us compared to any other knowledge, cannot be put into test in practice. An example is the concept which is acceptable in all sciences and philosophies, that is, improbability. In the previous sessions, I explained briefly that the improbable cannot be assumed initially as a hypothesis and then be brought to the laboratory to see whether it is impossible or not, because to be impossible means to be non-existing and to be impossible to exist. If a thing does not exist and has no chance of existence, we call it impossible. Let us ask these gentlemen who believe in the philosophy of action in this sense. Do you believe in the impossibility of a thing in the world? Is there anything in the world which, in your opinion, is impossible? Certainly there is, because statements and books are replete with such declarations that such and such is impossible or unattainable. On the issue of historical determinism, for example, they claim that in certain historical conditions, such and such event will inevitably and necessarily happen, and if those specific conditions do not exist, it is impossible for that event to take place. The philosophy of materialism itself presents hundreds of impossible things to us. Impossible means anything with two no's, that is, it has no realities. Impossible means void, no, two voids, void in terms of reality and void in terms of possibility. A thing may not exist, but it is possible for it to exist. How about the thing with two voids? You yourself believe in a set of impossible things. Can these things be accepted first as a hypothesis and then be tested in the laboratory or the real world? Essentially, we test means that we bring it first into existence so as to be tested or examined. Thus, it is not impossible. Therefore, the gist of the first objection to the theory which states that the criterion for knowledge is action is that assuming that it is correct, it is not correct in all instances. We have pieces of knowledge which are indisputable for all of us and among the clearest knowledge, yet they cannot be determined through the criterion of action. That is, they cannot be tested through the litmus test of action. Second Objection Let us assume someone says, such and such object undergoes such and such state due to the effect of heat. Afterward, we expose it to a hot temperature and see that it exactly undergoes the said state. That is, the proof of its being correct. Let us ask, what is the proof that the statement, if a thing yields positive result in practice, it is a proof of its being correct, is correct? For example, let us assume that our hypothesis is, iron does not expand at a hot temperature at all. Yet in practice, we see that it expands. How to know that this is a proof of the falsity of our hypothesis? Or, if we say that iron expands when it is heated and it really expands in practice, how can we know that this hypothesis is correct? They say, this is already self-evident. It is indisputable. As soon as they say it is self-evident, we say, so you also accepted what others say? You also held fast to a piece of knowledge which is a criterion itself. Now, as you also say the same, you are mistaken in taking action as the criterion. Again, you took knowledge as the criterion. That is, this is itself a piece of knowledge for you. In other words, action is that which has an actual existence. You have a hypothesis in your mind, and you give it actual existence. In actual existence, a hypothesis is formulated in conformity with it. So, you say that the criterion for this action, which has actual existence, 
is my knowledge which has mental existence. I say, the statement, action is the criterion for knowledge, is in itself a kind of knowledge. The statement, if the action is in conformity with the hypothesis, it follows that the hypothesis is correct, is in itself an idea or thought. It is a piece of knowledge. Again, did you acquire this very idea or knowledge through another action, or is it self-evident? They say, it is already obvious, it is self-evident. So I say, you are mistaken. You are among those who consider knowledge as the criterion for knowledge, and among the pieces of knowledge in the world, you believe in a piece of knowledge, which is the criterion itself, and that is this very knowledge. That is, you believe in something that is axiomatic. Third objection. Russell's objection that we have mentioned is this. When we examine it closely, we can see that incidentally of the pieces of knowledge which are criteria themselves, which you do not accept, you have accepted something as knowledge that is criterion itself, which is not actually a criterion itself. You have imagined that if a hypothesis is practically tested and yielded a positive result, this is a proof of its correctness. According to Russell, this is correct only when there is no possibility of the existence of another hypothesis alongside it. But if there is a possibility of existence of another hypothesis or hypotheses, how can we know that the correct result being achieved emanated from this very hypothesis? Perhaps there is another hypothesis which yields this result, and we know that only one of these two hypotheses can be true and correct. Practical Success According to Nahjul Balagha Let me cite some examples to you. There are many subjects about practical success or practical victory in Nahjul Balagha. Imam Ali, peace be with him, and Muawiyah, two parties, two groups, and two communities with two ways of thinking and two social philosophies, face and fight each other. The supporters of Muawiyah have a theory and scheme for themselves. They say our leader is Muawiyah who has formulated his own hypotheses and established Islam. While talking to his companions, Imam Ali, peace be with him, objects and predicts, Muawiyah and his companions will emerge victorious over you. That is to say, although your theory is the truth, you follow the rightful leader and Imam, and God the Exalted also says in the Qur'an that the truth will triumph over falsehood, and although they follow an illegitimate leader, and God also says in the Qur'an that falsehood is bound to be defeated in the end, I will tell you that given the existing conditions, I can see in you they will triumph over you. In Nahjul Balagha, Sermon 25, Imam Ali states, By God, I have begun thinking about these people that they would shortly snatch away the whole country. Why? When some individuals in the world today are asked as to who was on the right path, Imam Ali, peace be with him, or Muawiyah, according to the hypothesis of proving truthfulness through action, they say, we read that Muawiyah emerged victorious in the struggle and Ali was defeated. Ali was killed after four years and some months of caliphate, but Muawiyah became dominant throughout the Muslim state. So, this is a proof of Muawiyah's rightfulness and Ali's lack of it. Were some people not saying so? Are there no longer people in the world who say so? They do so according to the philosophy of action, saying, according to the philosophy of action, we should not focus on what Ali was saying and what Muawiyah was saying, whether or not Ali followed the Qur'an, whether Ali followed the Prophet's legacy lifestyle and sunnah, or what kind of a person Muawiyah was. We must focus on the practical results. We learned that Muawiyah triumphed over Ali in practice. So the truth was with Muawiyah because the proof of validity of a theory, school of thought or design is practical success. But the reply to this question is given by no less than Imam Ali, peace be with him, himself. Here, you think narrowly and say, the followers of Muawiyah followed a certain design, took him as their leader, and Muawiyah had a scheme and school of thought for life and society, while Ali also had a scheme and school of thought of his own. Since the school of Muawiyah triumphed over the school of Ali, this is a proof of the truthfulness of Muawiyah's school. If there were only these hypotheses here, then the issue could be easily presented as follows. There is Muawiyah and his school, which can be totally implemented, 
and there is a Ali and his school which can also be totally implemented, and Muawiyah triumphs over Ali, then that point would be correct because there would only be two hypotheses, for example, the school of Ali and the school of Muawiyah and the school of truth and the school of falsehood. In reality, when there were only two hypotheses, the proposition is as follows. If Ali is the rightful, he will certainly be victorious. And if Muawiyah triumphs, it is a proof that he is the rightful. Imam Ali, peace be with him, says that this is not the case. There are other hypotheses here which explain that this victory has nothing to do with either the school of Ali or the school of Muawiyah. The secret behind the victory of Muawiyah and your defeat, that is to his followers, lies in something which has nothing to do with either the school of Muawiyah or that of Ali. It is something that is related to your morale. In the words of Imam Ali, peace be with him, also in Sermon 25 of Nahjul Balagha, he says, he continues, through their unity on their wrong and your disunity from your own right. If someone looks at the issue from a distance and just superficially assesses it, he will say, it is the school of Ali which is about to be defeated and it is the school of Muawiyah which is about to be victorious. So the truth is with Muawiyah. But this reasoning is wrong. It is not the school of Imam Ali, peace be with him, which was to be defeated. It was these people of Iraq who were to be defeated because nominally they were following the school of Ali, but in practice they were not following it. Today, many people in the world repeat the same words on the basis of the philosophy of action, though with narrow-mindedness which was noticed by Russell and the like. Is Christianity's advancement a proof of its truthfulness? Christians have advanced the same argument, and now there is this notion. Islam is a school of thought, and Christianity is another school of thought. It is already senseless to look for the merits of Islam and the demerits of Christianity and say Islam is the religion of monotheism, while Christianity is a Trinitarian religion. Islam is the religion of equality, while Christianity is the religion of discrimination, and the like. What do these mean? They say, it is also mentioned in the Gospel that every tree must be known by its fruits. What is the point of examining the references and teachings of both Islam and Christianity? Let us look for the fruits of these two religions. As we look for the fruits of Christianity, what we find out is as follows. Christian countries are civilized and advanced countries. They are advanced both in material civilization and in cultural and spiritual matters. As we look for the fruits of Islam, what we find are Muslims who are backward people. According to the philosophy of action, that is, the philosophy which holds that criterion for truth is practical result and gives importance to nothing but action, this is sufficient for one to prefer Christianity to Islam. However, there is a very lucid and categorical reply to this notion. Look at a Muslim society and a Christian society. We will have such an impression that in Christian society, Christianity is totally implemented, and it is this implemented Christianity that yielded this result. And in Muslim society, Islam is also implemented, and it is this implemented Islam that yielded this result. Incidentally, the real score is something else. Open your eyes and think of it. In reply to a Christian clergyman who had this line of argument, Sheikh Muhammad Abdu said, It is a very sound reasoning to say that every tree shall be known by its fruit. We also accept it, but on the condition that we are certain that this fruit belongs to the said tree. So, the main point is this. We have to ascertain that a fruit exactly belongs to a given tree and not that we imagine it to be belonging to that tree where in fact it actually belongs to another tree. Along these lines, we also maintain that the proof of Islam's superiority to Christianity is that so long as we were implementing Islam, though relatively, we had been the most advanced nations in the world. As unanimously acknowledged by scholars, from the emergence of Islam up to the 5th, no, 6th century after Hijra, the torchbearer of culture and civilization in the world was the Muslim world. It was the Muslim world which brought into being a reality called Islamic culture and civilization from the fragments of different civilizations. And at that time, the Christian world was in utter savagery and barbarism. 
At that time, the Christian world clung to Christianity and the Muslim world also to the religion of Islam in a relative sense. As soon as we abandoned Islam and you abandoned Christianity, we began to decline while you began to progress. After the Crusades, the interaction between the East and the West, the circulation of travelogues in Christian countries, the connection you established with the Andalusian Moorish Spanish civilization, the students you sent there and the knowledge you acquired there, and after you violated Christian criteria and turned to Islamic criteria, your world flourished. Essentially, the emergence of Protestantism was the outcome of your encounter with the Muslim world. From the time you abandoned Christianity and adopted other standards, which were taken from outside the Christian world, and more than 50% of which were taken from the Muslim world, your world flourished considerably. And from the time we abandoned the truths of Islam and only small fragments of them remained for us, we plunged into misery. We suppose that Islam is being observed by us, but in reality, it is not. Therefore, action shows the correctness of hypothesis, but on the condition that it is a certain that another hypothesis does not exist. It is always like that in social issues. When we see in the world a people attached to a certain school of thought, it is indeed simple-mindedness to immediately attribute the success they might acquire solely to their school of thought. In many instances, there are many causes and factors which contribute more to their successes. Thus, the statement... If a hypothesis yielded a result in practice, it is a proof of its correctness, is correct after we are certain that no other hypothesis can be presented and the way is exclusive for the given hypothesis. As such, given these three reasons, it cannot be accepted that action is the criterion for knowledge. Again, we have to follow the same principle. We have two types of knowledge, knowledge which is the criterion itself, and knowledge which is not the criterion itself. Moreover, even if we accept action as the criterion for knowledge, in truth and in fact we have taken a certain piece of knowledge as the criterion for knowledge and not any other thing. The issue of pragmatism and utilitarianism. Three or four hundred years ago there emerged certain trends whose nature we have to know and not confuse with another thing. In the 16th century, some scholars introduced the trend of pragmatism and utilitarianism to the world. Perhaps Francis Bacon can be regarded its founder. Some came forward and said, why should we spend our time determining whether our knowledge is true or not? This is the same pursuit of knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Knowledge has no intrinsic value for man. It is a tool in the hands of man. It is a means of acquiring power. Francis Bacon defined knowledge as a form of power. That is, he placed knowledge within the framework of power. He said, why did the past scholars give so much value to knowledge and try their best to make their perception of the real world real? I do not want to make my perception real. Whether it is real or not, knowledge for man is no more than a tool which gives him power. Knowledge for man is like a teeth for a lion, a trunk for an elephant, and a horn for a bull. I want to benefit from knowledge in life and action. If a hypothesis is totally wrong but it yields results for me in life, I prefer it to a theory which is totally correct but does not benefit me in practice. They did not say that action is the criterion for knowledge. What these people instead said was that knowledge is not our concern at all, O oh man. Why are you so much insinuated not to be mistaken, to know the world as it is, and not to entertain any false or contrary idea in your mind? What is this insinuation that you succumb to? If the mind of a person is full of superstitious and erroneous ideas, but these ideas grant him practical success, he will prefer it to a situation when his mind is replete with truths which bring no practical benefit. As such, they held fast to the practical value of knowledge and not to its theoretical value. Today, some individuals may possibly say, in the schools of philosophy, we are also not concerned with truth or falsehood, correctness or incorrectness. We have certain objectives and purposes. We want to achieve our objectives. We will choose any means that will help us attain our goals, be they correct or not, right or not, true or not. In the parlance of the enlightened thinkers, this idea is expressed in this manner. They say, what is the duty of an enlightened thinker in this society? His duty is to emancipate his society. 
If it is colonized, he must emancipate it from colonialism and rescue it from oppression. These enlightened thinkers may possibly consider two options. The first option is for him to strive hard to reform his people's way of thinking. For example, he would say, O people, you have such and such belief on such and such object. You believe that there is such things as affection by witchcraft in the world. I want to prove to you that this is senseless. You believe in good and bad omens. I want to prove to you that good and bad omens do not exist. He says, I have to purge my people's mentality of false ideas and other ideas which cannot be allowed by any enlightened thinker. Thereafter, we will tell them whatever I think is the truth, and then I will begin my mission of emancipating them from oppression, colonialism, and exploitation. They say, this enlightened thinker will never succeed. Sir, you want to deliver your society. You want to fill the empty stomachs. You want to eradicate discrimination in your society. You want to look for the solution of the wealth and resources of society being plundered and taken away by foreigners. What business do you have with their ideas, correctness or incorrectness? In many instances, you can make use of the same incorrect idea of their affairs to attain your goal or objective. In many instances, by relying on the same superstitious beliefs, you can bring about a strong force to fight colonialism and oppression. Which of the two options must be chosen? They say, if you want to choose the enlightened thinker's way of correcting their mentality first, and then rescue them, you will never succeed. But sometimes, if you would reply on the same superstitions, you can emancipate them easier. If you tell the truth to them, you make them your own enemies. Never tell the truth to them. Rely on their superstitions. For example, it is possible that this enlightened thinker who is not in favor of nationalistic feelings as he is one of the so-called internationalists would say the entire human family is but one community. They are all human beings. What are these nationalistic feelings for? Although he has a nation that faithfully supports him, he says, first I have to remove from their minds the nationalistic feelings and ideas of this nation, which I consider ridiculous and work on the basis of humanity and internationalism. They say, this enlightened thinker will never succeed, but if he would rely on nationalistic criteria which he himself does not accept, and immediately organize a force, through this force he can attain his goal, which is the emancipation of these people from oppression. That is, through a wrong idea, wrong theory, or ridiculous hypothesis, he will attain his goal. Even in a society with religious ideas which are totally ridiculous, what solution does the enlightened thinker of today think of? He himself is not religious, or at least his religion is different from theirs. For the deliverance and emancipation of his people, will this enlightened thinker take a step first for the eradication of superstitious ideas? No. He will make use of these very superstitious forces and emancipate his society. They say, this is a proof that for practical success, it is not necessary that the theory, the hypotheses, or the plan to be implemented by the people be always correct, right, true, or real. So those who cling to the philosophy of action have the following argument. We must never be mesmerized by truth. It has been a mistake in the past to be much mesmerized by truth and falsehood. We must be outcome-oriented. This is a way of thinking, which is different from the way of thinking which states that action is the criterion for knowledge. That which maintains that action is the criterion for knowledge wants to state that these two are joined together. Whatever has yielded results in practice is truth. This is what I am rejecting here. As I have promised in the previous sessions, there are other subjects on the issue of the relationship between action and knowledge which I will discuss, albeit briefly, with you. Is action the only key to knowledge? They say that action is the key to knowledge. Is this assertion correct or not? This assertion is of course correct, but it requires explanation and commentary. Action is the key to knowledge means that if a person does not engage in any activity, just stays home and shuts all doors, and then he wants to know the world, he can never know the world. It would be impossible. In the earlier sessions, I recited a verse in the Qur'an 
from Surah Nahl, verse 78, which states, God has brought you forth from the bellies of your mothers, while you did not know anything. He made for you hearing, eyesight, and hearts, so that you may give thanks. First, the Qur'an leans on the senses which essentially represent action. It is inductive reasoning, istiqra. It does not only say that God gave you ears and eyes, but it rather says afterward, so that you may give thanks. That is, it is not proper for me to say, I have eyes and ears, but I will stay inside a room and shut its door. Since I have eyes and ears, I will spontaneously acquire knowledge. No, so that you may give thanks means that you have to make use of your senses, which is the same inductive reasoning and investigation, tajassus. Thus, to that extent, this assertion is undoubtedly so valid that action is the key to knowledge. But is action the only key to knowledge? No, action is the first key to knowledge. By means of action, we can open for ourselves the door of knowledge and acquire a set of information. Then, it is the turn of the second door. We have to open the second door with another key. By means of the second key to knowledge, we can acquire higher knowledge. This is what I meant in the previous sessions when I said that superficial and logical knowledge are two basic stages of knowledge. In fact, we also have two stages of logical knowledge. Action, or senses, is the key to primary superficial knowledge, that is, the key to gathering raw materials of knowledge in the mind. If we do not work with this key, the turn for the second key will never come. It is like going inside a room which is at the back of another room. Unless we open the first door, we cannot go inside the second room. When we opened the first door, studied the world, and acquired whatever was acquirable for us through the senses and inductive reasoning, did we acquire all knowledge? No. The second key is that which is described by the Qur'an as the fu'ad, and by philosophers as the aql, intellect, or reason. It is also so that you may give thanks, according to the Qur'an. That is, it must also be acted upon or put into practice. Thus, if we consider action to be inclusive also of intellection and reflection, then action is always the key to knowledge. But the mistake is committed when, in saying action is the key to knowledge, they limit action to actual action, which refers to observation and examination. This is not so. Actual action, that is, observation and examination, is the first key to knowledge. The second action, and there is no problem in calling it action now, is a sort of mental action through which we perform the second stage of knowledge, that is, the stage of logical knowledge. But the gentlemen who say action is the key to knowledge focus only on the actual action, or the observation and examination portion only, without paying any attention to mental action. This is while actual action, or observation, is also done by animals. While flying, birds also make constant observations. Horses and sheep also make observations. It is sufficient to discuss this issue to this extent. Another question is this. Which action is the key to knowledge, individual action or social action? This question is raised when dealing with issues relevant to society. This question was raised at the time of Ludwig Feuerbach, while discussing the issue of praxis and considering action the criterion for knowledge, Feuerbach said social action is the key to knowledge. That is, regarding the knowledge of society and history, only social action is the criterion for knowledge. Natural man, insani fitri, and acquisitive man, insani muktasib. There is yet another issue which I shall also discuss, and if ever necessary, I will explain both of them in the next session. They say, action, that is, work, is not only the criterion for knowledge. It is not only the key to knowledge, and not only any type of action. It must be social action. In fact, basically, work is productive. It is creative. It is work which molds and has molded man. It is work which has built and brought history into being. What do they mean by work is practical work or actual social work? What has made man human? They say it is work. 
man has become human by means of his work and not through anything else. What has brought history into being? It is work. What has brought into existence the means of production? The means of production is the very work as it acquired actual representation. This is the opposite of which idea? What do others think in this regard? Others say it is considerably true that work molds man, but to say that man acquires all things from work and that even the human conscience as a whole is a product of work is not correct. According to Islam, the issue of man's natural disposition, or fitra, is relevant here. This is exactly one of the basic theoretical differences between Islam and materialist schools of thought on the question of constructive factors in history. Islam believes in fitra for man, man being the natural man, or human race, or every creature created in the form of man, or for every creature which is biologically classified as human being, that is man. Conscience is a requisite of his constitution. It is his very conscience which is responsible for historical progress, that is, his very fitra. His work is a product of the same conscience. The same conscience is responsible for his advancement. According to Islam, man's work is an offshoot of his conscience. According to the materialist school of thought, however, man's conscience is an offshoot of his work. According to Islam, we have two dimensions of man. One dimension is the natural man, insan fitri, which refers to his innate disposition. When man is born, he is potentially endowed with a set of noble and sublime qualities. When man is born, he is potentially moral, he is potentially religious, he is potentially a seeker of truth, he is potentially a lover of beauty, he is potentially free. All the values are potentially within him. He is like a tree that must be nourished with water, light, and other needed elements in order to grow and produce these values within him. This is the natural man. We have also the acquisitive man, or insani muktasib. This is one of the principles of Islamic teachings. What is the acquisitive man? It is the man molded by his action. After having the primary innate values, man is molded by his own action in the second stage. However, he is molded in one of two ways. One possibility is that he is molded in a way harmonious with the intrinsic values. He becomes a real human being. Another possibility for him is to be molded in such a way incompatible with the intrinsic values. He becomes a metamorphosed human being. In this regard, there are two materialist schools of thought which are against us. One is the school of dialectual materialism and the other is existentialism. Both of them are opposed to Islam in this regard. That is, they do not believe in the natural man. On account of regarding the notion of fitra as essentially opposed to freedom, existentialism is against any notion of nature or mold, supposing that any notion of nature or mold is repugnant to the spirit of human freedom and liberty. So, accordingly, man is devoid of any nature or essence. He is devoid of fitra. He exists while having no nature, essence, and even fitra. What man does, he does it on the basis of his choice. Marxism does not say so. It does not subscribe to such freedom. Having a different argument, Marxism states that man is nothing in the beginning. Accordingly, the natural man is an abstract man. It does not recognize Islam's description of man that everyone born of a mother is born in a state of fitra. According to Marxism, everyone born of a mother is nothing in terms of being human. Everything is endowed to him by work. His conscience is endowed to him by work. Whatever given to him is given by work. The issues of infrastructure and superstructure come to the fore here. Work also includes productive and non-productive works. According to them, therefore, it is work that molds the human conscience. Man acquires conscience, but his conscience is given him by work. In whatever social class he is and whatever type of work he has, man's conscience depends on his class status and type of work. But Islam does not say so. According to Islam, all human beings have the same innate conscience. A secondary conscience can also be acquired through action. 
Action also molds man, but what it molds is the secondary man. Next week, God willingly, I will explain them more and proceed to another subject. On account of his arrest by agents of the Shah Pahlavi's regime, the lecture series on the theory of knowledge by the author Ayatollah Murtaza Mutahari in Tawheed Center, Tehran, ended here. The martyred professor had a lecture series in Qum under the theme Knowledge According to the Qur'an, which is, in a sense, complementary to the present topic. By the will of God, the transcription of these lectures will be published in the near future. End of chapter 10 End of The Theory of Knowledge and Islamic Perspective by Ayatollah Murtaza Mutahari And with that being said, may God's salutations be upon Muhammad and his pure progeny.